politics and faith as we wrap up another election season. Um, I'm not sure how many of you get robocalls on your cell phones, but those of us stuck with landlines at home have been besieged and are still under assault and are waiting for the end very soon from people to stop calling us. But there are a few topics that are of greater concern probably than the political process from a liberal arts perspective. Um, it's hard to imagine trying to make political decisions without a broad perspective that understands all the different nuances. Um, it certainly isn't just the domain of political science. Those, those are usually the people behind the curtain trying to control the way we think and force us to um, come to wrong conclusions about things. But uh, this is a great chance for us really to unleash every corner of our mind to think about what's happening in the world of politics, not just the presidential election, but really all the way down, down through the system. So thank you for being here today. And Robbie Bolton has been uh, kind enough to really put the panels together and organize this, and he's going to come and give a more specific introduction. Thanks, Roger. Uh, I think Roger took almost everything I have to say, so I don't know what introduction I have to give now. Thank you. No, uh, seriously, my name is Robbie. Uh, I'm the assistant library director, and the CPLA committee, Christian Perspectives in the Liberal Arts, when we are talking about these two community of learners this Friday and next Friday, um, the quirk of the schedule, they're one, one week apart. And right before the election, we thought it would be a neat opportunity to have two discussions. So this is just part one. We're having a panel with this, these four faculty this Friday, and then next Friday, we'll have four new faculty participating in a similarly, similarly styled panel. Um, briefly, we've got uh, Dave Globig from the School of Business, Mark Edwards from History, Jen Letherer from Film, and Paul Patton uh, from Communication Theater. And we've asked, asked each of them to share for seven minutes on what politics, faith means means from, from their perspective, from their discipline's perspective, um, and they each might come at that a little bit different angle. What I'd ask you, uh, we're, I'm gonna try to keep them to seven minutes, and I'll give you a little warning when you've got about one minute or so left. Um, but we want, we're intentionally wanting to keep that time short to allow at least 20 minutes, maybe even 25 minutes, for question and answer, for you to ask questions. So as, as each panelist presents, if something jogs, jogs you or uh, gives you a thought or a question, write it down, make a note of it, and I'll be running around with a microphone um, after each of the panels have presented, giving you an opportunity to ask questions at that time. The other thing I would ask, when we think of political discourse in the United States, and maybe just political discourse in general, I don't know, um, there's a lot of uh, emotionally emotions. Uh, people are usually have their hot button issues and they're passionate about this or that, um, and they put their campaign stake in, in their sign of the yard to stake out, this is who I am or this is what I think. Um, but I ask you to be very open-minded as you maybe hear some of our faculty present or provide perspectives that are different than the ones that you currently hold, or as, as your peers and our peers ask questions. Be open-minded to try to understand where they're coming from, as St. Francis said, with a desire for understanding, uh, less of a desire for being understood. Um, so, thank you. With that said, we're going to start with, uh, from here from history, from Mark Edwards. And Mark, thank you. And, uh, can we turn the uh, screen, or is it froze? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, PowerPoint. We're going to start with one of our presenters is not using PowerPoint, so I'm going to ask Paul Patton if he will be our first presenter. And you can just stay there in the chair, Paul, you have your mic. But if you want to stand, you certainly can. We're going to be fiddling with the computer a little bit while you do that. Thanks. Okay. Um, it was 1972, Nixon was running for re-election against uh, Senator George McGovern. 
the end of war candidate too liberal for an overwhelming percentage of evangelical Christians who preferred maintaining the existing order preferred, who preferred the standing president. And of course, hindsight is always a tad easier than making the who to vote for call on the basis of 30 second advertisements and endless concentric circles of mass mediated massages. And remember, this was before the heightened prominence of the silver bullet that we now call image management. And I would just like to make a little parenthetical, uh, though I'm not a historian. Can you imagine Abraham Lincoln or Woodrow Wilson responding to an aide that says, we have to be more concerned about your image management? <laughs> oh, yeah? You can imagine them saying? And probably something like this. I don't care about image management. In all honesty, I can't remember who I voted for. But I remember standing on the voting line at Holcomb Elementary School. I was 19, two years out of high school, politically ignorant with a dismantling case of theological fragmentation that couldn't make any consistent sense out of political responsibility. Jesus was more than just all right, a little reference to the birds, little ditty that we sang so innocuously, but certainly less audacious than any major party promises of deliverance. When asked about uh, the thoughts regarding politics and Christian faith, I'm reminded that our founder of the Free Methodist Church basically uniformly warned all people against becoming involved in political processes because it was going to be an instrument for their spiritual demise. And part of it is because we as a tradition have no theology of compromise. My recommendations for understanding the very complex processes that are the 21st political uh, uh, opportunities for presidential and senatorial and congressional races, and my primary concern at this, at this point as a, as a theater guy and as a mass comm guy is what does it take, uh, for instance, amongst our students to get them prepared for the possibility despite the difficulties of their theological past, the limitations of their theological past in terms of Christ and politics what it takes for them to consider public service. The best book for me on trying to understand the complexities was Richard Ben Kramer's treatise in the uh, regarding the 1988 presidential election, where he took uh, a, a brief biographic sketch of the four top candidates from each party. And again, what it takes the road to the White House one of the things that he concluded was it takes an incredible level of audacity, a level of ambition and tenacity beyond most of our abilities to imagine. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul, though, when he provides us with his 21st century, you know, ancient equivalent of a 21st century resume where he says he and his evangelistic entourage first have tremendous endurance. That's what it takes. And I'm afraid that most of us don't have it. An ability to respond to rejection in the midst of criticism, to be able to stand up after getting knocked down. Another book that I highly recommend in, from a, a calm perspective is Neil Postman's uh, classic from the 1980s, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which describes the televisionization of most of, of 20th century realities, including the political realities. Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, 
Also, I highly recommend in trying to be prepared from a communication perspective for these kinds of political processes, Daniel Borston's The Image, The Guide to Pseudo Events in America, and recognizing that a lot of the political uh, necessities of getting elected are pseudo events. I'm also very quickly going to ask, what uh, can you imagine interviewing William James Bryant from our tradition, essentially, the three-time nominee, nominee, presidential nominee of the Democratic Party? I'm also concerned uh, uh, about what it takes the road to the White House or to the road to any kind of civic responsibility as an elective official, the necessity of being able to sleep well. The ability to avoid mental illness and the ability to avoid bad hair. There will be probably no more presidential candidates with bad hair. All right, I'll just start and they'll catch up quickly. Um, the first two uh, film posters that you see in here are actually misnomers, and there they go, um, because I'm not really going to talk about films like that at all. I, the ones that are up there are, um, are uh, ones about presidents that are kind of snarky biopics of, you know, of presidents. I'm not gonna really talk about that at all. The first quote that'll come up, there it is, um, this is from uh, the famous French magazine, the, the great journal of uh, film called Cahiers du Cinema, and I'm not going to try and murder those Italian names of these uh, wonderful editors, but they said every film is political. Every film is political because it's a product of its ideology. In other words, every film comes from a point of view. Even Napoleon Dynamite, which I'm not going to linger too long on because I spent two hours of my life watching that movie, and I'll never get those two hours back, and I'm disappointed. <laughs> so, but what I want to leave you with is this idea that um, every film makes a statement. Some of them are explicit. Some of them are very political. Yes, I can tell that they are in favor of this or that this is good. I can see that this is good, um, and, and I can see that that is, is, is bad. And a lot of them are implicit. Take, for instance, a Disney film. A lot of Disney films tell you that in order to be successful in life, you need to be pretty. In fact, every Disney film tells you that. And don't think guys are exempt from that. Did you see Beauty and the Beast, right? It, when you're a beast, you're no good. At the end, when you get redeemed, you get turned into a handsome man. Only pretty people survive. That is the implicit morality of every Disney film. Are there some wonderful things about Disney movies? Absolutely, but the ideology is mixed. There are, there are things that it tells you this is good and, and this is not so good. This is the way to be happy. This is the way to, not, to, to get into trouble, I guess is what I'll say. So every film is political. Next. Um, as Paul said, uh, the idea of image management goes a long way in, the, in the, um, the 21st century and the latter part of the 20th century. By the 1980s, we elected a movie star president. And then you can see over here um, on the left side of the screen, Kevin Kline being a president or being presidential in a movie. That the idea of who we have to be to look up to someone is that we need to look up to someone who, who is like a movie star because movie stars are our monarchs, our kings, and therefore, the person who's in charge of our country needs to be like a movie star, too. Next. Uh, documentaries. I want to talk a little bit about this because a lot of political films are documentary films. There is a rash of them in the past five to ten years, and I think will only get worse. Documentaries, and I don't say, I like a lot of documentaries. I made it sound bad. I didn't intend to. Um, a lot of documentaries espouse a point of view. They are message documentaries. 
They have a tradition in the United States. In 1960, um, uh, some of the folks, this is Robert Drew and Associates and a lot of really famous uh, documentarians from the 60s, the people who kind of changed the documentary film. Um, they made the film Primary, in which they followed JFK in a senatorial race, a primary in, I think, North Dakota. It's a very famous film. And remember that JFK was a very good-looking man, and he got elected because he looked good on television. Primary is one of the things that helped motivate that, and Primary was a movie about politics in the United States. Also of note that when, when television really began to realize that it had great power to sway the masses, that we started doing TV documentaries. So there's, this is a picture of Edward R. Murrow standing in front of a field. This is the, the very famous 1960 Harvest of Shame documentary in which he talks a lot about migrant workers in California. So the message documentary has been around for a long time, and it's very explicit in its point of view. What it's doing is telling you, as a journalist, that this is bad. Look at this atrocity that's going on. We as a, a, a public need to do something about that. That has come into fruition in the 21st century with the modern documentary. I've listed a few of them down here, the message documentary. There are lots of them. The three that I list here are Bowling for Columbine, um, An Inconvenient Truth, oh, no, I'm sorry, four. The War Tapes, there's a picture from The War Tapes. If you're not familiar with The War Tapes, this particular film was, um, was made by giving um, uh, a group of folks headed overseas, I'm not sure if it was Iraq or Afghanistan, um, everybody received a, a videotape recorder, little little camera, and lots of mini DV tapes, and they sent them back. So all the soldiers made the film, because the footage is them shooting the film as it's going on. Um, they created the film with their own, in a sense, home movies. The last one I mentioned here is The Cove, which is not a political documentary, and yet it is. The Cove, if you're not familiar, won the Oscar about three years ago. Um, and the cove is about the slaughter of dolphins in Japan in order to, to make profit by them, right? So it's more of a social political documentary. Um, <clears throat> I say this to a crowd who gets inundated with documentaries every day. You do, because there are a lot of documentaries out about wonderful, very good causes, and they are base emotional appeals to you to feel guilty about something that's going on in the world and to throw money at the problem and then feel better about it. I'm not, it, you know, that's, that's out there. Some of them are really wonderful, very educational sound films. Others are base emotional appeals and you're going to have to wade through the difference between those two things. My last slide. Um, the last uh, film and politics thing I want to talk about is Frank Capra. Frank Capra was a, um, a filmmaker of the 1930s and 40s. He made some films in the 50s. Um, a very famous filmmaker. The film that you know, if you, if you know one Frank Capra film, is It's a Wonderful Life. <clears throat> He's very famous for a couple of other ones, though, that also had a, a fairly explicit political message. The first picture up here is from the film Meet John Doe. There are some critics who've argued that this is Gary Cooper, and Gary Cooper is a uh, he's, he becomes a very charismatic voice of the people. He's the John Doe. He's the everyman. And uh, the forces that be that have kind of brought him into power are suddenly going to use him to get somebody elected. Um, some critics have argued that Frank Capra was a populist, um, that he had a political uh, uh, platform. But there are other critics who have said he wasn't a populist at all. What Capper really talked about in his movies was personal integrity. If you watch the films more closely, and here's a still from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and we're going to watch a clip from that in just a second. These films aren't about this side is right or this side is wrong. They're about one person living with integrity and that integrity making a difference. I find that really interesting, and here's why. One, Frank Capper was an immigrant. His films are extremely nationalistic. He loved the United States. It is nowhere more evident than in films like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington in the clip that you're about to see. He loved the United States. What he was saying in films like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is that there's nothing wrong with the democratic system. Our system works great. He said the problem is personal integrity. If people acted with integrity in our political system, we would have a much happier country, a country that ran much more smoothly. To add to that, I'll add one quote, and then I'll ask Robbie to play. No, well, I'll not quote an idea. I'm not quoting him directly. I'll ask Robbie to play the video. And it's this. When C.S. Lewis was talking about politics, he talked a lot about um, monarchy, uh, which we don't live under a monarchy. But he also talked a little bit about democracy. And he said, a democracy is important because everyone needs equal power. Everyone doesn't need equal power because everyone is equally entitled. Everyone needs equal power because we are all equally culpable. 
we're all human and we all have feelings and shortcomings. Uh, democracy works because every person needs to be held in check, not because every person is entitled to something. Robbie, will you go ahead with the clip? Here it comes. Wait for it. All right, this clip, I'm just going to talk a little bit through it as it's going on because um, Robbie has to manually mic here. Um, if you're not familiar with the story, Jimmy Stewart here playing uh, newly uh, appointed Senator Smith because he doesn't, it was a, there's a little plot involved in how he gets to be a senator. He, he arrives his first day in Washington and he's so excited to go around and look at all of the monuments. He's so excited about all of the things that are, um, uh, Washington DC represents about our country. So he goes around and you can tell through these shots, this beautiful montage with this beautiful music, that it is a celebration, it is a love song to the United States government. Um, here he's viewing again the uh, Declaration of Independence. These kinds of, of montages, and this film was made in 1939, right after this Frank Capra would be called by the United States government and asked to make pro-war propaganda film. In other words, the films that, that let Americans know this is the reason we should be fighting World War II, that we have a moral imperative to fight fascism. So these kind of montages are what landed Frank Capra as kind of the voice of American patriotism. I'll give you one quick note as you're getting ready to watch um, the stuff at the Lincoln Monument. For those of you who've been able to hear or pay attention, you'll notice that there is not just a montage of images, but a montage of music, that every selection of music is an American folk piece, and therefore it is also, in a sense, Americana on every level of this film. Thank you. And now we'll uh, hear from Mark Edwards from History. There you go. All right. I just want to make uh, three observations about uh, the intersection of faith and politics in American history. And uh, I'm going to. I'm going to skip over my prelude and go right to uh, the first observation. I'm sorry I couldn't come up with a, a D word for everywhere, uh, but Dr. Holsinger Friesen invented a word for me, so I'm grateful to him. Uh, but whenever you look at politics in American history, you see that faith uh, has been present. Uh, it's not simply that we tend to e elect uh, persons of faith, and particularly Christians, into office. Uh, it's that our entire political culture. Uh, is infused by faith, faith, uh, faith elements. 
which is not to say that faith has been dominant. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. When you study American history, what you see is that Christianity has been shaped by the political culture as much as it is shaped. Uh, one example where you do see Christianity playing a shaping kind of role is in the political parties, um, particularly how the political parties go about trying to get people excited uh, about, their, about their platforms, the political campaign rally. Uh, the modern political campaign rally was invented at the same time that the Second Great Awakening was going on, and historians have noted that uh, political campaign rallies tend to look like religious revivals. Uh, and I think that's kind of held through American history. I think political campaign uh, rallies still uh, have that aura of the religious revivals uh, of the Second Great Awakening. And so you see, uh, you see faith shaping not just the, the personal views of our candidates, but our entire political culture. You can see elements of faith there. Oh, just, uh, just an aside, you, you think uh, attack ads are pretty nasty today? This is an attack ad from the uh, 1800 election. Uh, that is God sending the American Eagle to stop Thomas Jefferson from sacrificing the Constitution on the altar of Satan. <laughs> now that's an attack ad. Uh, second, we see that faith's influence in politics has been diverse. Uh, namely, Christians have had uh, a really hard time agreeing on how they should respond to major events. Uh, let's take war, for instance. Uh, the American Revolution, we'll start there. Uh, it's true, uh, a, a lot of Christians sided with the idea that resistance to tyrants is obedience to God, that this was a, a religious sanctioned war. However, there were a large number of Christians, loyalists, uh, who believed that, you know, that whole verse, honor the king, uh, the higher powers are ordained by God, uh, that you don't go against the king, uh, God established the king, and to go against the king is to go against God. And so uh, a lot of Christians uh, in the colonies remained loyal uh, to George III. And then there were a number of Christians, uh, pacifists, mainly Quakers, uh, who said we can't involve ourselves in war uh, whatsoever. So Christians really disagreed on this major event in our history. Uh, do I even have to say that Christians disagreed over the Civil War? Uh, I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> Uh, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Christians uh, came down on supporting the war, uh, against the war, against being against war in general. Uh, Christians, just, uh, when, we, when we look at major events in our history, Christians have just had diversity of responses. Uh, and so there's been no kind of uniform Christian response to politics or Christian perspective on politics because Christians have just been so diverse in the way that they have engaged or not engaged in the political process. The only thing I'd say is that uh, religion's involvement in politics uh, for positives that we could talk about has also been dangerous. Uh, it's been dangerous particularly to uh, minority groups. Uh, take the issue of religious minorities. Um, it, it's true that we established religious liberty uh, at the time of our founding, but religious liberty in the United States until, I'd say, the past 50 or 60 years has really meant religious liberty for Protestants. What we see after the revolution and the passage of the Constitution is that Protestants worked really hard to create a, a social, political, uh, and legal uh, conditions in which it was really hard to be anything other than a Protestant. Uh, Catholics faced discrimination. Jews faced discrimination in American history. Uh, Muslims have and, and still face discrimination. We're still working out religious liberty. Mormons. Uh, faced a great deal of religious discrimination. Uh, if you don't believe me on this, take the occasion to ask Mitt Romney if you think that he's ever been discriminated against uh, for his faith. Now, wait until he's done running for office because he'll give you a straight answer then. He probably can't answer that question right now, but the fact is that even in 2008 and 2012, Romney has, because of his Mormon faith, has faced discrimination because religious liberty in the United States has been of a Protestant kind of nature. Uh, another form of discrimination, the, the role of Christians uh, in, in promoting racial discrimination in the United States. Uh, and I can't go back, I don't have time to go back into the history of slavery right now, but uh, the development of, of white supremacy, white supremacy developed in the United States as a justification for the institution of slavery. Uh, Christians have been uh, involved in and in maintaining uh, notions of white supremacy uh, all throughout American history. And I'm not just talking about the KKK. 
Uh, we can talk about the citizens' councils in our own backyard. This is a sign from uh, Detroit in the 1940s. Uh, when African Americans began leaving the South to move into northern cities like Detroit to work in defense jobs, uh, white citizens of Detroit organized themselves in the citizens' councils to make sure that African Americans knew where they could and could not live and where they could and could not work. Uh, the resistance movements, uh, violent resistance movements, uh, to the Brown versus Board of Education decision in the 1950s. Christians were uh, involved in leading that. Uh, Christians desperately tried to hold on to uh, the segregation system in the South. Uh, Christians have been involved in, in uh, even after the Supreme Court uh, banned uh, anti-misogenation laws uh, in the 1960s, Christians have still uh, been involved in trying to uh, maintain uh, racial discrimination uh, and prevent intermarriage. Uh, I won't name this Christian college, but is, uh, there was a case in 1999 where a Christian college denied admission to a student uh, because that student's wife was African American. Uh, and the, the letter of justification was, he went back to the Tower of Babel, and there's a tradition of this. My students in 141 are reading a book uh, about this this semester. Uh, that God separated the races, uh, and so we're, who are we to bring together what God has separated? Uh, and that was their understanding of the Tower of Babel, and this student could not get admitted to this college. So, uh, again, we see faith's influence in politics as a dangerous kind of thing, uh, and let me just kind of conclude on this note, which is why the Founding Fathers uh, created a government in which organized religion could not play a too great a role in our political system. You know, if you look at the Founding Fathers on, on, on the issue of religion, they more or less understood the, the three observations I've just made. They understood that faith is everywhere, they understood that faith is diverse, and they understood its, its danger too. And they had kind of a twofold response to religion. On one hand, the Founding Fathers believed that religion was important to the kind of society that they were rebuild, building. Uh, religion promotes good morals. Good morals are essential to a free society. Most Founding Fathers agreed on that. Uh, however, they knew their history. They knew that Christians historically have had a hard time playing nice with others uh, or playing nice among even themselves. Uh, and so they designed a government in which uh, interest groups in general, but religious groups in particular, could not exercise too much political power. Uh, and I could uh, go more into that, but I think I'm uh, out of time at this point. Yes, thank you, Mark. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Dave Globig from the School of Business. One thing I thought of as Paul was speaking is that that was also my first election. The only thing I remember about that was it wasn't fair because my younger, younger brothers could also vote for the first time because that was at the time we switched from 21 years old to 18. So that was one of the changes we saw back at that time. My perspective also is influenced by the fact that I spent 12 years on a school board, local school board, and had that opportunity, which gives you quite a unique perspective as well as right now I'm involved with doing the surveys for one of our representatives, so it's given me that perspective. Two or three things I want to mention before I hit the major area. And some of the things I think we need to look at what God says about things, and there's some things that are very clear that we should at least take a look at our um, candidates and where they stand on those issues. One would be the pro-life issue. God's very clear in Psalm 139 that you know, life begins at conception. I think that needs a former perspective. Also, God is very strong in pro-life. One man and one woman, God's come out across very strongly on that, so that should influence our thought. But the key thing I want to hit on is the area of debt. I think it's almost become a moral issue is the amount of debt we've taken on. Although really, what we see as a nation is we've taken on debt kind of response to the individuals. As I was on the school board, I realized every person's personal values and where they were personally influenced how they were going to decide in a group like that. Illustration came, we were looking at a situation where we purchased these piece of equipment. Every year we always paid cash. And the discussion came up and have these buses. Why don't we go ahead and start borrowing for them? And of course, I have a different perspective on it. I thought we should go ahead and continue paying cash. But I quickly looked around and realized everybody else in the room borrowed for their vehicles. So I realized this discussion was going nowhere. So it showed that people in place of responsibility view the world from their own perspective. And if they look at it from a certain perspective, that'll influence their votes. The amount of debt we have, we talk a lot about the amount of federal debt they have at $16 trillion. But actually, to me, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of unfunded or undeclared debt. And I, we just did a panel a couple last month on the amount of debt we had. We have between 61 and $80 trillion in unfunded debt. You say, how? Social Security. 
If this was a private enterprise about 15 years ago, the accounting profession required them to show the amount of obligation they had promised their retirees. And when they did that, I think it was GM or Ford, wiped out 85% of their equity because they had that much liability that they had to put on the books. The federal government, state and local governments, your local school boards do not show that amount of liability. If we did, it would show that we are much further in the hole than we think we are. So we get concerned about this 16 trillion. Last year we added 5 trillion unfunded liability besides the 1 trillion that was noted. So there's a lot of debts there. We also see individuals, credit card debt is $850 billion. The debt for cars and those kind of things, 1.8 billion. De mortgage in our country is 13.7 billion. This one is probably relates to most of you. The GSL or student loan debt is pushing $1 trillion. And it's now gone past the credit card debt. It's growing at a very rapid rate. So one of the things we see is really almost a moral issue is the amount of debt we've taken on. There comes a point in time which we can no longer handle that. To be honest with you, if we put all of our debt on the balance sheets, we would find that we're probably in much worse shape than Greece is. Greece is in difficult shape, but because we're big enough, we've been able to get by with it. But I think it's a moral issue that as people, we need to be concerned about that, because otherwise we're gonna basically you know, create some major issues for our country. Something that came to my attention about two years ago is the fact that when we borrowed money about two or three years ago with China, in order for you know, some good collateral, they asked us to put up our national um, parks. One of our students went out during break and checked and found that that was true. We put our national parks up as collateral. Now how China would really collect it could be a challenge. This is still the fact that we put up our national parks show the amount of debt we've taken on. I think it's just a challenge for us to be aware of that. How is influenced politics? We actually have one segment of one party that's pr predominantly created because of the debt issue. It's called the Tea Party. Tea Party's biggest concern, is my observation, was the amount of debt and trying to get some handle on that. So just gonna want to give a perspective. From the business viewpoint, you take out too much debt. Look what happened to individuals with their houses. Look what's happened to other school districts, other places. They've taken on too much debt, they can't handle it. And it's because of that we've got some real issues. All right, thank you. If we could give a round of applause for all four of our panelists. And now, uh, if you have questions, we've got a couple of mics. Uh, we'll come around. You can respond or ask a question based on something one of our panelists said, or if you've got something else entirely, um, you can go in a different direction. Yeah. When you said that we put our national, <laughs> excuse me, just been... <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, but when you said we put our national parks up for collateral, if, say, China wants to collect, that would pretty much mean the end of the national park system, if you're correct. That's correct. So basically, and if, in your opinion, what would happen in national parks if China got a hold of them? Well, politically, I'm not sure how we really, I'm not sure the people would allow them to do that, but we have put it up, legally, we've put it up as, as their collateral. They would take them over, I guess, probably start charging so people would have to pay more to move into it and actually take advantage of our parks. In reality, I'm not sure how they would collect, but it just shows the extent of debt that we've taken on. Anyone else with a question? Dr. White. Billy Graham took out an ad in uh, a number of national newspapers arguing that Christians should vote for a candidate who is pro-life, who is pro-marriage, and that he thought that this was probably the most important election he had ever lived through. I would like each of the, can each of the candidates, <laughs> each of the faculty members to comment on uh, what Billy Graham has done. Well, well part of the, um, the controversy over what he has done is some, of, as you know, um, have contended that his son has uh, has maneuvered his 93-year-old father to become more uh, political and to even speak for him, Franklin Graham. I would, I would probably say that's not the case at all, but there are some that are contending that this is so uncharacteristic for Graham uh, that that might be a component. Um, I, I, I think of George Will also in responding to the debates who said uh, it's uh, some of the most significant substantive deba debates of his uh, uh, adult uh, political memory. Uh, clearly, in fact, a, a large uh, percentage of, of, of Catholic voters are saying 
um, absolutely, I cannot vote for the president because of his, um, uh, of his position on abortion. Uh, but it's also interesting to note that um, uh, Mitt Romney's position on abortion is that, that he allows uh, for abortion in special uh, cases, in case of the, uh, uh, the health of the mother and, 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 and in cases of rape, which um, uh, many uh, uh, pro-life uh, uh, groups would uh, disagree with. Uh, the whole question of, of, uh, of, of marriage, uh, obviously one that's, uh, that's very, very significant. Uh, typic uh, I would agree with, but I would agree, I think, with Graham that, that these are central and significant issues. Um, I guess I'll start by saying it's an advertisement. Uh, it's an advertisement. <clears throat> We're selling morality. And I, I, I guess that's, that's one of the things that I, whenever I see things like that, that I begin to think about. Can you, can you sell morality, or is Christianity, is the gospel, is the truth, simply the truth? And we need to preach it because people need to hear it. We don't need to sell it. We just need to say it. Um, and, and so you know, taking out an ad in order to purport something um, seems to be selling instead of stating from a pulpit. And even from a pulpit to be, you know, as, as Mark so wonderfully pointed out, a huge danger area. In fact, you can, you know, you lose funding and you lose a lot of faith if you, you know, if you're mixing those two things together. And so um, I, I, that's where that's where my mind went on those things. Um, the way that the ad is, is structured, the way that what you mentioned, I've not seen the ad, um, so only from uh, for inf from information, um, is that it uses buzzwords which boil down complex issues into very quick snippets. And it's very easy to take sides when you can go, I, I don't know the ins and outs of the debates on these subjects. All I know is that, oh, <clears throat> this person whom I trust is saying this. And in some respect, that's part of the way the political process works, right? That we, in, you know, we let people we trust make decisions. That's the way it's supposed to work. But uh, that the way in which we're given, this is this issue, here's how we're gonna talk about it, is two words or three words, and that's it. And you have to make a decision based on only that. And you're called on, you're not asked to debate, you're not asked to discuss, you're not asked to do research, you're called upon to take those two words into your head and then spit out a response. And it's usually an emotional response, not a logical one, and not even a mix of emotional and logical, or like the four pillars of the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Uh, I'll just make three observations. The first is uh, most American voters and Christians involved say that the most compelling issue of this election is the, the economy uh, and which party and which candidate has a better approach to the economy. Uh, and uh, it's around these times that the, you know, you have to vote for the pro-life and pro-choice uh, and gay marriage. These issues come out, but I, I think there's other ways for Christians to evaluate candidates based on where they stand in those issues. Uh, second thing I'll say is that the president doesn't make laws, Congress makes laws. Uh, and so if Christians are really concerned about making a, a difference, uh, restraining, restricting gay marriage, or promoting gay marriage, or pro-life, pro-choice, uh, then they should spend a lot more time focusing on who they're going to put in Congress. Uh, third thing I'll say is that Roe versus Wade is not a law that can be overturned. This is a Supreme Court decision. And rightly or wrongly, it was crafted in such a way that it's almost impossible uh, to, to overturn it. It's almost impossible to touch it. Uh, and so I'm very skeptical. I've become very skeptical because I've heard presidents since the 1980s, and I voted this way since the 1980s, say, if you elect me, I will overturn Roe versus Wade. You can't do that. They can't do that. And so you have to figure out ways of working in a, a legal working in a structure in which uh, abortion is going to remain legal. I guess I would respond to it in that I think it's important for our faith to form our opinions on these people. Are there good and bad about every single person that runs? Yes, but we have to, and actually it should not affect our whole life as we talk about the concept. Our life and what we learn from God's word should in fact inform us how we're gonna make choices and unfortunately, you know, people go down on both sides with that, but I think it's important for us to spend time in God's Word and understand that. Will it give us clear understanding? Probably not, but I think it will at least help inform us. Otherwise, we have a tendency to just go with whatever 
the last person said, and it's really kind of scary. All right, thank you. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Over here. I think we've got a mic on the other side. Thanks. Um, okay. So pretty much when we're, I mean, I guess as students, are, you know, our big question is, you know, how are we going to decide, you know, who we're going to vote for in the end? And when you sort of look at it, you know, unfortunately there is no, you know, Democratic, Republican, and Christian party. And all the Christian sort of topics have sort of been, you know, mixed up in this bag and then just sort of dispersed because <coughs> you say, you know, oh, well, I really like how this side is about, you know, dealing with the poor. I really like how this side is about, you know, um, you know, keeping life sacred, you know, all those different topics that are mixed into each party. How, from a faith and politics perspective, do you sort of wade through those without saying, oh, this is obviously the topic that Christ cared most about, or this is the topic that, you know, he would have, you know, pushed under the rug. How do you look at those and sort of say, well, you know, it's a mix of everything, but, I, you know, I'm going to look at it this way because... <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll start by saying this. You know, I, I hold a lot with I, I, um, the idea of, of personal integrity because even if someone is a different religion than me, that, you know, what, you know again, what Mark mentioned about the Founding Fathers saying that, uh, you know, more, uh, teaching morality, um, if, if you have personal in integrity and you're working on your own personal integrity, let me take one not so hot button topic, which is the environment. If you are living your life in response to how to be a good citizen in terms of good use of our natural resources, then you can make decisions about other people who are up for election and the way that they truly are. I think there's been a rise in you know, really understanding not just what a, a political candidate says, but also what they do and the way that they live out their life. Um, and now, there's something to be said for, you know, how much personal scrutiny any person should have to withstand and the way that it gets spun in the media, which is all over the place. Again, we're electing movie stars, so it's, it's how you feel about them, you know, not, you know, not a, a long-term look at their life. Um, but you, you, you have to do your research, you know, you have to, um, you have to find out more about what is being said about things. You have to look at different points of view. And then eventually you have to make a decision. And how you make that decision, I think it's wonderful that, you know, that Dave said, you go back to the word, of course, that's, you know, the, the rock on which we stand. Um, but, I, you know, I mentioned the Wesleyan quadrilateral, that there are ways in which we make decisions. And, and the way that, that John Wesley laid that out is that you looked at tradition, you looked at experience, how, what you've been through, what you've learned. Um, you looked at the wisdom of other people, and, and, and you also took, um, which one I'm missing? Scripture. Um, you also took a look at the Word of God. So, you know, that's how I think we should be making decisions beyond the political realm. I think that's how we need to learn how to make decisions in our own life, and that should only naturally carry over to um, how we're making decisions politically. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, politics is the art of the possible. Uh, it's, it's not simply a matter of understanding what a candidate's particular views are, but it's understanding whether those particular views have any chance of, of entering into uh, the policy realm. Uh, and that's really going to come through research. To, to me, uh, history is a way that I kind of make sense of what is possible, what isn't possible, what claims I take seriously from candidates, what claims I tend to think are, well, they're, they, they, they might score among voters, but they're really not going to you know, translate it into anything. Uh, which is all that to say that is there, there is no kind of easy way to go about prioritizing. Uh, as I said, the general, the general feeling right now from opinion polls is that the, the major concern of Americans is, is the economy. Uh, and I think a lot of people are gonna vote on how they feel the economy is going and also whether they feel Republicans or Democrats have a better handle on that. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's one marker. Uh, a lot of people say the economy is the main issue. Um, that's an issue that the parties might have a, have a say uh, on. Briefly, we, we, yeah, what? last you got the last word, Paul. Uh, the last word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my one of my concerns is the fact that uh, we uh, in the twenty first century are increasingly discomforted by a two party system. 
that, that seems to, in some times, say the same thing, but at other times be at polar opposites. And particularly difficult for evangelical Protestants who don't like to identify uh, 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 sociologically, psychologically, uh, historically with any church movement through the through the centuries, so that we can conveniently say I had, you know, no collective identification with the Crusades and any other you know, Christian historic pockmark. It's the same. It's the same instinct that prevents us from saying, I don't want to identify as Republican or Democrat because I have to somehow identify with some portions of the platform that I'm not comfortable with or that are ugly or that are inhumane, and yet both options have you know, some inhumane aspects to their plank, and so our natural pro uh, propensity is to just withdraw from both and say, I'm independent, I'll make up my own mind. Well, that's oftentimes a, a recipe for political disaster, because you don't have people who are passionately committed at the party level saying, this is, a, you know, part of this plank is a pile of crap, and we need to address it and confront it, even if it means I'm going to be uh, potentially kicked out of the party. Uh, I think our, our, our evangelical, uh, fundamentalist, independent uh, 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 denominational tendencies have, have a propensity to, uh, to give us justification for not being involved at the political party level, and uh, I'm an embodiment of that uh, ludicrous position conveniently ludicrous position. I like to, con uh, you know, as an artist say, I'm apolitical. Well, sorry, Paul, uh, that's probably not an option. Maybe one final comment. Having been involved in surveys for one of the first people on the second series of these I've done, often you can find out, because we have to do surveys for probably 60 or 70 different groups. And there's a few surveys this person decides he's not even gonna bother to respond to because he knows that they're not gonna support him. But often with those surveys, you get a good sense of what people stand for. If you're interested, I'm sure you can contact those politicians and find out what their opinions are, because there's a lot of these surveys coming, covering many different topics. But a lot of it comes back to being involved. Does it take time on my part? Yes, but I think if I'm involved in that, then I'm being able to make somewhat of an impact on the world around us. It's part of the concept. All right, thank you. Just 10 seconds, uh, if I may say also, I, I, I'd like to look at the, the, the book of Daniel for the whole notion of sticking points in terms of political involvement. How was it that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to take pagan names but not pagan food? I think that, for me, is an insight uh, for uh, political involvement and, and identifying what sticking points are and the possibility that we have different ones as Christians. All right, well, thank you very much for your time, and we hope to see you again next week.